Hello, I'm John Foster, and I'm a medical doctor who does Social Security Disability exams. And today I'm going to talk about medical conditions that I commonly see patients indicate as causes of their disability, which rarely help, with some exceptions, which I'll describe. As usual, everything I say is based on my own opinions and study, and not the opinions of the Social Security Administration or any other medical body. But first, I'd like to describe a little bit about my job. I've heard it said that the doctors who do Social Security consultative examinations just want to say that there's nothing wrong with the patients. That couldn't be further from the truth. I've never felt any pressure from the Social Security Administration or anyone else for me to describe patients as being better off than I think they are or worse off than I think they are. I simply take a medical history, examine the patient, and write down my findings. The only times that I've been contacted by the Social Security Administration about patient reports is when something is somewhat unclear and they want me to clarify it. Second, every time I do a day of Social Security disability exams, the patients seem to fall into three groups. The first group are obviously severely disabled. They've had terrible illnesses or injuries. The second group have some medical problems, but it's difficult to say if they'll qualify for disability or not. And again, it's not my job to make the final determination of whether a patient meets Social Security criteria or not. And the third group are patients that have little, if anything, medically wrong with them. In fact, I'm always amused when I get to examine a patient who is obviously in better shape than I am. I'm in pretty good shape for a 67-year-old man. And I do see some patients who are obviously fit and clearly work out regularly, telling me that they can't do anything. Part of my medical practice includes being a ringside doctor for fighting sports, mixed martial arts, Muay Thai kickboxing, Marquis of Queensbury boxing. And let me tell you, I can tell when somebody's an athlete. Always keep in mind the the abilities that Social Security considers important in a disability evaluation. Those are the abilities to sit, stand, walk, lift, carry, handle objects, speak, travel, understand, remember, concentrate, persist, interact socially, and adapt. And to that list, I'd add the ability to see, and to hear and understand normal conversational speech. I've listed these abilities in the description below. If you're applying for Social Security Disability or having a consultative examination, you want to focus on the problems that you have that interfere with those abilities. Spending time on medical problems that have no bearing on those abilities won't help and in fact may hurt because you're wasting your and the doctor's time. The classic example and the one that always gets a chuckle out of me when I see it is erectile dysfunction. Now erectile dysfunction may be a terrible problem for one's quality of life, but it does not affect one's ability to work. The most common irrelevant problem that I see listed is high blood pressure or hypertension. Now, hypertension is a serious medical condition that often needs treatment, but it very rarely affects the ability to work unless it causes a complication such as a stroke, a heart attack, or kidney failure. There are some very rare patients who have a condition called malignant hypertension, where the blood pressure can be extremely difficult to control and shoot up to very high levels. I saw the first such patient in 1982, and it was a female who had a blood pressure that would shoot up to over 300 millimeters of mercury systolic, and she had to be admitted to the hospital multiple times to treat that. I've seen one such patient in a Social Security Disability exam. 
However, if you have high blood pressure and it's not causing problems, not making you go to the emergency department or being admitted to the hospital, it will not help your disability claim. The next problem is headache. Now, if you look at Social Security's listing of impairments, there is a section for headache and certain severe headaches, usually migraines, will qualify a person for disability. However, the average headache, which is called a tension headache, will not. Most patients that I see who claim to have migraine headaches do not meet the medical criteria for migraine. And if you're going to complain of a headache as a disabling condition, I'd suggest you look up the medical criteria for migraine. And the next problem is insomnia. Social Security doesn't even list insomnia in the listing of impairments. And personally, I find it hard to feel great sympathy for a person with insomnia, having missed many hours and nights of sleep as a medical doctor. In fact, in my training, I once went five days and four nights with zero sleep and continued to work. The next conditions are not disabling if they are asymptomatic. Asymptomatic in medicine means the disease is not causing any symptoms or problems for the patient. The first one is asthma. Now, asthma can be severe and disabling. However, if you're an adult and you have had asthma as a child, but haven't had any attacks since becoming an adult, as is common, it won't help you to claim asthma as a disabling condition. For asthma to be disabling, I would expect the patient to have a history of frequent emergency room visits for asthma and or frequent hospital admissions for asthma and especially if the patients required intensive care or ventilator support for asthma. Next, two infections that are often asymptomatic, yet patients complain of them as disabling conditions. They are hepatitis C and HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus. Now, both of these viruses can cause very severe problems, but in most cases, they do not. Hepatitis C is a virus that infects the liver. It's fairly common, and in most cases, it does not produce any serious problems. In some cases, however, it can produce liver cirrhosis, which is scarring of the liver and liver failure, which is so much damage to, to the liver that the liver cannot function properly. Those two conditions can be very disabling, but simply having a positive hepatitis C test is not. In the terms of the human immunodeficiency virus, we have such good antiviral treatment now that there are many people who are positive for the human immunodeficiency virus, but have little or no problems. If you have AIDS, which are severe problems caused by human immunodeficiency virus, Social Security considers you disabled, period. AIDS includes infection with HIV, plus certain cancers, infections, or other conditions such as AIDS, dementia, or severe diarrhea with weight loss. So again, if you have hepatitis C or HIV infection and you have no symptoms or problems, it will not help your disability application. However, if you do have severe problems due to either virus, it definitely will help your application. The next condition that doesn't help is gastroesophageal reflux disease, also known as GERD, G-E-R-D. I've never seen or heard of a case where this helped the patient's application, although I've seen it listed frequently as a disabling condition by patients. Temporomandibular joint dysfunction, or TMJ, pain in the joint of the jaw, 
is basically worthless in a, on a disability claim. Irritable bowel syndrome, or IBS, is a mixed bag. In most cases, it is not disabling. However, I want to emphasize the importance of frequent or uncontrollable diarrhea. Social Security definitely considers having to go to the bathroom multiple times a day, and especially inability to control diarrhea as serious problems. And if you have either of those for any reason, be sure to indicate them and tell your physician. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is rarely helpful as well. There is a condition called sarcoidosis, an autoimmune disease that most commonly is not disabling but can be. Sarcoidosis usually shows up in the lungs and often it's detected on a lung x-ray whether the patient has no symptoms at all. If that's the case, it won't be considered disabling. However, some unfortunate patients with sarcoidosis get severe lung damage and are short of breath, and in that case, it will be considered a disabling condition. Next, I want to talk about diseases related to substance abuse. In North America today, in 2022, usually alcoholism or opioid abuse. Social Security will not grant disability because one is addicted to a substance. If one gets a physical disease as a result of substance abuse, and the disease would get better if you stopped using the substance, Social Security's policy is to not grant disability. However, if you get a physical disease as a result of substance abuse and the condition is permanent and would not get better if you stopped using the substance, then Social Security may consider it disabling. Permanent conditions may include such conditions as cirrhosis and liver failure from alcoholism, or bacterial endocarditis and heart valve damage from intravenous injection of opioids. As I've mentioned before, if you do have a problem with addiction, it's a very bad idea to show up for your consultative examination drunk or stoned, and I've seen both. Another condition I see patients claim disability for, which I find rather sad but will not work, is cancer that has apparently been cured. If you have cancer and it cannot be cured and is causing problems, there's a very high chance that your disability application will be approved. However, if you've had cancer and it's been treated with surgery or radiation therapy or chemotherapy and has not recurred for a considerable period of time, it will not result in a successful disability claim. Finally, I want to talk about the duration of disability. Social Security considers a person disabled if they have a disabling condition that has been present for at least 12 months or is expected to be present for at least 12 months. If the condition will resolve or get better in less than 12 months, Social Security will not grant disability. I see this in people who've had major accidents and injuries. Sometimes they come in very early after discharge from the hospital. They may have such things as healing broken bones or healing wounds. In many of the cases, it's expected that by the time 12 months have elapsed, they'll be pretty well recovered, and those folks will not have their disability application approved. However, if you've had an illness or accident and it's been more than 12 months and you have not improved, then your disability application may definitely be approved. And if you've had an illness or accident and it's less than 12 months, 
but it's expected that things won't improve. A real example would be a, an accident that resulted in an amputation of a limb. That's obviously not going to get better. Then your disability application may be approved. Well, I hope this has been helpful, and as always, remember, if it happens, it's possible.